What's up artists, my name is Ryan Talbot and today I'm going to be showing you how to use the X Particles Infectio modifier to create some detailed gold dripping effects inspired by the Daredevil intro. Then I'll show you how I created the gold material in Octane and finally an overview of my comping process in After Effects. Let's do it! Before we jump into Cinema 4D, I just wanted to go over a couple of the inspirations for this project. So the first one is this Cartier ad that was created by The Mill. Uh, it's got this really cool underwater atmosphere where you got these volumetric light rays and all these golden particles that are floating in the air. So that's really cool. And then obviously the effect that we're trying to recreate here is this liquid uh, pouring effect from the Daredevil intro. And I think what's really unique about this is that the liquid is being poured over extremely detailed models and they manage to maintain that level of detail even though it's a fluid simulation, which is really cool. If you actually go read about this intro, um, you can see that they did use real flow, but there's a little paragraph down here where they mentioned that they actually developed custom fields to get the fluids to flow the way they needed them to. They also remeshed multiple sims together and played with the world space scale to cheat speed. So the way I interpret developing custom fields is that this might not be something that you can actually do out of the box with real flow. And that's why I'm going to try and do this in X particles as opposed to real flow today. Alright, one more thing we need to get out of the way before we get started is how to get the Infectio modifier. So you need the early access version of X Particles 4 in order to access it. And the way you do that is a little bit convoluted in my opinion, but here's what you gotta do. There is a download link that you got when you first ordered X Particles. I ordered it through Grayskill Gorilla, so it's in an email I got from them, and this is the link that I first downloaded this from almost a year ago. So you have to go back and find that email and find this big long number at the end of that link. So you take this big long number, you copy it, and then you replace it right here. Once you have that, you copy this whole link with your download number and you paste it into your browser. Once you do that, it should send you a verification email and then it'll download it for you. So here I have a mannequin model which I purchased off of cgtrader.com and the first thing you want to do is head up to X Particles and drop in an XP system. Then you want to head over to your emitter and you want to change your emitter shape here from rectangle to object and under the object you want to select your mannequin. And now if we head back to the start and hit play we should get a bunch of particles shooting out of our mannequin. Now let's turn off our mannequin. Now let's head over to our emission tab and let's change this from rate to shot. That way when we replay this, the particles shoot from frame one and that's it. The next thing we want to change is the particle speed. Right now it's set to 150, let's change that to zero. And if we play that back, now our particles freeze the second they spawn. What we're essentially doing is we're building the mesh of this model through particles. So the higher particle count you have, the more detailed of a simulation you can create. So for now, let's turn up our particle count to 200,000. I'm gonna pump those numbers up. Those are rookie numbers in this racket. And just be careful that you type the right number of zeros in there. One too many could crash X particles. And Cinema 4D. <laughs> so let's reset that and play it one more time. And now you can see we have more particles, but they're, uh, they're emitting in the polygon center. So let's head back over to our object tab right here, and let's change our emit from polygon center to polygon area. And let's replay that one more time. And now you can see the particles are evenly distributed across our model. Now, it looks a little creepy to have these two spheres for the eyeballs in there. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn back on our mannequin for a second, head into face mode, and then hit UF, and then I can just click on these polygons right here and hit delete, and delete those eye sockets. Cool, so now if I turn off our mannequin once more, reset our particles, those are gone. So the next thing we wanna do is set up our Infectio modifier. Let's head over to modifiers, and under control modifiers, let's choose Infectio. So by default, the color mode is set to fixed value. We want to change this to use groups. When we do this, 
we're going to be asked for an incubating group and an infected group. So if we head up to our groups up here, and then we click create group, we have particle group one. I'm going to rename this to incubating. And then I'm just going to control drag to duplicate that and change this one to infected. And now let's change the color down here to red. That way we can differentiate the two groups from each other. So if we head back into our infection modifier, let's drop our infected group into the infected slot and our incubating group into the incubating slot. Now, nothing's gonna happen yet because what we need to do is create a new seed object. So if I click on this button, we get a seed object and that will spawn way down here at the bottom. So let's grab that bad boy and let's move that all the way up to the top. Now, we want this to intersect with our particles. And so I'm gonna move this to the top of the head where we want our particles to start forming or infecting. And let's play this back. So now you can see our particles start flying off into the distance, and that's because we need to change our group settings. So under infected, you can see we have our own particle speed and radius. This is almost like an emitter, but it's not an emitter. So we can change this to zero. And let's do the same thing for our incubating group. And now the speed should not change. And if we hit play one more time, our particles are now infecting from the top and they're not moving. Um, the problem now is that they're all infecting at the same rate. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna head over to our infected group and I'm gonna change the editor display to squares. I'm gonna do the same thing for our incubating group right here and our emitter. So if I head over to display, I can go from dots to squares. And now let's reset that and play back. So now we can actually see our infection much better. Now comes the fun part. We're in our emitter in the display tab and underneath editor display, we have color mode. So what we wanna do is we wanna change this from single color to use shader. Now, what we're about to do is we're going to control the rate of infection with a noise pattern. So the darker particles are going to infect slower and the bright particles are going to infect faster. So let's put a noise pattern in here and let's click on that. And I'll make this window a little bit bigger. And I'm gonna crank up that contrast and I'm gonna turn up the global scale to maybe 500% and I'm gonna stretch it on the Y axis by 300 just to start. And now let's reset that and see what happens. All right, the particles are now infecting in a cool pattern, which almost looks like liquid pouring down. Now, why don't we throw this in a VDB mesher to see what our mesh is gonna look like. So under generators, I'm going to choose VDB mesher right here. And if we scroll down, we have a list of sources, which is currently empty. So let's throw our infected group in here. And now you can see we got this marshmallow blob, <laughs> this wonderful blob going on. And that's because our point radius is way too big. So let's come to our point radius right here and let's change this to one. And you can see it completely disappears because our voxel size editor is bigger than the point radius. So let's make our voxel size editor one also. And now we got our particles back. Cool. So let's play this and it definitely does not look like liquid yet. So we wanna come over to this filters tab right here and we're gonna check use filters. So this is gonna smooth out these particles. And you see we got a median filter by default, which is all right, but we're actually gonna delete that and we're gonna add a Gaussian filter. And you can see that really smooths it out. Now I'm gonna share my solution to you with a very common problem that I found using the Infectio width of mesher, and that is this ugly stepping effect that you get from frame to frame. And there's a couple things you can do to solve this problem. The first thing is if you head over to your Infectio modifier, um, you wanna change this incubation multiplier from one to five. And what this does is this actually speeds up your infection, and by speeding up the infection, that makes that stepping effect disappear. The other thing you wanna do is go to mode and then go to project, and there's a tab for X particles right here. 
and there's this thing called subframe steps. If you turn this up to two, now it's gonna be calculating in between your frames as well. And this will result in a smoother motion. With those two things changed, I'm gonna reset it and let's play it back one more time. And you can see it's infecting much faster now. Now would be a good time to increment and save your project. If that's not something you're in the habit of doing, I highly recommend it. Just go up to File, Save Incremental, then it will just duplicate your document and add a little 0001 to it. That way if all hell breaks loose, your file gets corrupted or you don't know how to get back, you do some crazy undoable action, you always have the old version to go back to. So first things first, I'm going to go back up to my emitter and uh, let's crank this up to 1 million particles. So I'm just making sure I got six zeros in there. <laughs> And let's reset that and it's gonna lag a little bit and we'll let that play out but you see our liquid is already much thinner I went back and adjusted some settings to refine the look a little bit more and the first thing I did was if we head back into our noise pattern um, I actually lowered the the white brightness to 85% right here and what that will do is just slow down the entire infection I also increased the scale to 600% and then I stretched out the Y to 1000% so that we get these nice long streaks running down the body. The other thing I did, if we take a look at our mesh in the VDB mesher, is I layered up a few different Gaussian filters. And the reason I did that is because if you just use one Gaussian filter and then you turn up the number, uh, what happens is it kind of eats away at the entire mesh. And that's how you lose the detail really quickly. So the first one I just set to iterations to width two, but then if you layer another Gaussian on top of that, it rounds out the existing details rather than eating away at the entire mesh. So the more Gaussian filters you layer up, um, the more detail you can get while smoothing it out. So I found that three was a good number. You can't really tell yet because we can't play this back in real time, but once it renders, you're going to see that it's infecting really fast. So one way to control the speed of the infection is to head over to Infectio and decrease the search radius. So for my final render, I had that set to 5. Another thing to note is the infected particle lifespan. You want to crank up this number really high, that way your particles don't die out halfway through your animation. If we head over to the General tab and scroll down, we can see that I also added the incubating group as a source for the VDB mesher. And I set this to difference mode, so it's subtracting the incubating particles from the infected particles. So if I set this back to union, you can see now it's including them. I think now would be a good time to set up our first cache, that way we can play this back and see what it's going to look like. And this is sort of a stage where you're going to be caching it, playing it back, seeing what needs to be tweaked, tweaking the settings, and then recaching it, and sort of repeating that process over and over again. So I'm just going to show you how to set up your cache, and you do that under Other Objects, XP Cache, and right here under Folder, you want to make sure that you save this to a place where you can easily access it, like in your project file. So I'm going to go down to my tutorial file, and I already made a folder in here called XP Cache. So I'm just going to make sure it's saving in that folder and hit OK. And the other thing is I'm going to make sure that my timeline is set to the number of frames I want to cache. So right now it's set to 50. And that's because we don't want to wait around for two hours for 300 frames to cache and then find out that we need to change the settings and recache it anyways. So you could usually tell within the first 50 frames uh, what, what you need to adjust. Um, so I'm just going to hit build cache and it's going to ask me if I want to overwrite it because I already did do a cache and I'm just going to hit yes and it's going to start caching. A few moments later. All right. So our cache is finished and now we can we can play it back, we can rewind it and we can see that it's cached. But in order to see this in real time, we need to make a preview. And before we do that, I'm actually going to turn off all these distracting particles so that all we see is the mesh. And then I'm going to hit Alt B and that's going to bring up my make preview command. And by default, it might be set to full render. We don't want to use that because then it's going to use all of our final render settings and that's going to take a really long time. So I'm going to set that to hardware preview. 
I got my preview range selected, I got MP4 format, and 1920x1080p. All those settings look good, so I'm going to hit OK. And now we're going to see this little calculating preview icon, and you can see it's calculating right there, and boom, it's already done. So let's see what this looks like. Cool. I went ahead and I cached a little bit more of the animation, and I'm pretty happy with how, how it's looking. So let's set up a nice camera movement in here. Now there's this trick that I like to use, cool camera trick, where if you hit the middle mouse button, you get your four uh, orthographic views. And so I actually like to go into this second one right here, change the display back to quick shading, and then set the camera to perspective. And now what I have here is a secondary viewport. And why this is really helpful is because I can now set up my camera in this first viewport and look through it and then I can head over to my second view and I can navigate through the scene without touching my camera. Now if I load up my Octane preset and then I'll enable my live viewer and now you can see I'm navigating around the scene but my Octane view is staying the same so oops I can drop a cube in here I can add some lights to the scene and I can I can adjust these lights around and move everything in my scene without actually changing the camera angle. Cool camera trick. Now we can start to build our material and block the lighting in. So I'm just going to grab this octane glossy material and I'm going to change the diffuse to black and then I'm going to change the specular to a hue of 27, saturation 41 and a value of 100. And then if I come down and bring up the index to 8, now we got this metallic material. So I can drop this onto my head, and now we can start blocking in the lighting. I'm going to come up to Objects and bring in an HDRI environment, and I'll rename that real quick. And in the image texture, I'm going to load in this HDR Studio, which I got from Polygon.com. And now you can see we got these nice reflections. The next thing I want to do is actually remove the HDRI from the backdrop, that way it's only being used for reflections. So I'm going to duplicate my HDRI and name this one Visible, and then I'm going to come over to the tag right here, and I'm going to change this to an RGB spectrum, bring it to black, and then under Type I'm going to change it from Primary to Visible. And now we have a nice black background, but our HDRI is still being used for reflections. The next thing I'm going to do is just drop in a plane down here, and I'm going to scale this up until we can start to see the reflection in our mannequin. Then I'm going to add an Octane object tag to that, and in the visibility tab, just uncheck camera visibility. Now if I come over to my glossy material right here, I'm just going to turn up the roughness temporarily so I can see what the lighting is looking like. The next thing I'm going to want to do is add an Octane camera tag to my camera, and under post-processing, I'm going to enable that and turn up the bloom to something like 20. This always looks really nice with metallic materials on black backgrounds especially. The next thing I might want to add is a nice rim light. So I'm going to grab my Octane targeted area light and I'm going to grab this null right here that it created and I'm going to move it up to where we want our light to actually point towards. Now I'll grab my light and I'll move that up as well. And, and let's move it somewhere behind the head at a nice angle. Maybe back a little bit more. And I might even make the light thin and stretch it out like that to, to create this elongated tube. And now if I come over here, I can turn up the power even more and turn down the temperature to get some nice warm lighting. The last thing I'm going to do for this step is I'm going to come to my Octane settings and I'm going to change the kernels from direct lighting to path tracing. So if I actually compare this real quickly um, and then change it to path tracing, you can see on the left we have path tracing and on the right we have direct lighting. So this fills in the shadows, especially on the inside of our model. Next we're going to build our swirl material and then we can come back and tweak the lighting once we see what our swirls are going to look like. Next, I want to get into how I created the gold swirl material, and to do that, I need to mention this guy. Um, he goes by Mankind on Instagram, but his real name is Rhett Dashwood, and he created this series a while ago called Sorbet Tumors, where he created these really cool acrylic photo textures, 
and he was even kind enough to put these up online for free. Um, so I went ahead and I downloaded these. I'll include the, the link to this as well in the description. And this is what they look like. And for my gold swirl material, what I ended up using was this image right here. Um, now the only issue is that these images do not come tileable, so I had to create the tileable version myself in Photoshop. Since there are plenty of YouTube tutorials out there on how to create a tileable texture, I'm just going to go over it briefly. The first thing you want to do is go up to Filter, Other, Offset. And what you want to do is offset it by half the number of pixels as your original image. So because mine is 3264 by 2448, I'm offsetting it by 1632 and 1224. So I'll hit OK. And all we have to do now is create a new layer and pretty much cover up these seams. There's a couple ways to do this. The first one is to take your smudge tool and literally smudge across over the seams like so. Another way to do it is using the clone stamp tool and for example cloning this area right here and then just going over the seam. Another thing that's really important is never to go over the edge of your image. Once you do that then you are breaking the tile so you want to get as close as humanly possible without actually painting over the edge. All right, so now you should have something kind of like this. This is what we had before, and this is what we ended up with now. And now I can go up and export this as a PNG and add it to my tileable textures. So to animate this texture, what I did was I put a displacement map on this using fractal noise. So I hit Control Y to create a new solid, and then I'm just gonna type in fractal noise up here and drag that onto my layer. Now I'm going to change the fractal type from basic to swirly, so we get that swirl look, and from soft linear to spline. Then I'm going to go into transform and scale this up to 500. From there I'm going to turn down the complexity from 6 to 1. And instead of animating the evolution, we're just going to offset the turbulence. So I'm going to hit the stopwatch, and we're going to start at 5000 and then I'm gonna go all the way to the end and make this zero. So now we should have something that looks like this. The next step is to pre-compose this with shift control C and I'll name this fractal noise and I'll hit okay. And now if we jump inside that comp, let's create a new layer, hit okay. And I'm going to fill this with black. Now I'm going to mask off the center bit, something like that, and I'm going to invert this mask. Uh, that way the edges are completely black. And then we're going to feather this out, and we're going to change the mask expansion until we know that all of our edges are completely black. This prevents the animation from breaking our tileable texture by only displacing the areas in the center. So if we head back out, I'm going to turn off this layer and I'm going to type in displacement map and we're going to drag that onto our tileable image and we're going to set the layer to fractal noise, set to effects and masks, and we're going to turn this up to something like 100 and 100. And now let's see what happens. We get this edge on the top and the left, which we don't want. So we're just going to check wrap pixels around. And now you can see it is tileable once again. One thing I forgot to do, if we jump back into our fractal noise, I'm going to create a new layer with uh, control Y, hit OK, and then I'm going to make this an adjustment layer. So now if I type fast blur in here, I'll drag this onto our layer and I'm just going to turn this up to something like 38. And now that just blurs out our fractal noise. Um, that way we don't get these harsh edges um, in the displacement. And it looks a little bit cleaner. So once you're happy with all those settings, you can hit Control M and queue this up and export it as a PNG sequence or a JPEG sequence if you want to save some hard drive space. Hit OK, and now you got an animated texture. Now that we're back in Cinema, let's start plugging in our swirl material. So I'm going to open up the node editor, 
and then I'm gonna navigate to my acrylic texture folder right here and I'm just gonna drag in this first image and I know that my sequence is 719 frames long so if we head over to our animation tab I'll type that in as our end frame and I'm gonna change our movie frame rate to 24. Next I'll plug this into our roughness map and head over to editor and check animated preview. Now you'll notice not much is happening at first. That's because we need to change our texture tag settings from UV mapping to cubic. So if we reload this, now we can see our swirls, but it's too big. So I'm gonna scale this down from 100 to 50%. And let's reload that one more time. And now you can see that's about the right amount of detail I would like. The next thing I'm noticing is that the floor reflection right here is actually pretty distracting. So I'm going to create an octane diffuse material and I'm just going to change the color to somewhere in the middle um, to lower the brightness of that and then I'm just going to drag that onto our floor. And now you can see our reflection is much more subtle. There's actually a bit more to the material than I just showed you, so I'm just going to hop over to my finished material and do my best to explain the node tree to you, and then in addition I'll upload the material so anybody can download it and use it in their own projects if they wish. So with this material, this is what the node tree looks like. You can see the only three channels I'm using are the specular, roughness, and the normal. That's it. For the specular, all I have here is my image texture, which is the swirls, um, piped into a gradient. That way I can change the color to this goldish tan, and then that's piped into my specular. For the roughness, same exact setup, except I'm bypassing that gradient altogether and just piping the image texture directly into my roughness. The normal map is where things get a little complicated. Basically, all these mixed textures are adding in another layer to my normal map. So if we start at the beginning, I use this car flake shader, um, which is just a normal map used for cars. I have two iterations of that. I renamed this one flakes small, and this one is just flakes. Might as well rename that to flakes large, because that's what it is. And then those two are being combined into this mix texture, which I renamed car flakes. The amount is being controlled by a noise, that way some areas you see the small version and some areas you see the large version, and that also helps break up the tiling. From there, I mixed in this smudge map, which I got for free from the French Monkey's website. Same deal here, the amount is being controlled by a noise, that way the smudge map pokes through in some areas and then the car flakes poke through in other areas. From there, I wanted to take down the strength of my normal, so I mixed in this flat gradient. So all the gradient is is a single color which emulates a flat normal map. Then for the amount, I just mix that in by 0.2. The next thing I wanted to mix in from here is our swirls map. So I'm using the same exact node, um, that way I don't have to duplicate it a bunch of times, and I'm just bringing it down here into this color correction node, which I renamed to strength. And I renamed it that way because all I did was bring down the brightness of our image texture before piping it into the amount. Now, I did not put a second texture in this mixed texture because all I wanted to do was have my normal map show up inside the swirls. So instead of a mixed texture, this acts more like a mask. Finally, I wanted to take down the overall strength of my normal that now that I have it set up. So I did the same thing here with a gradient and a single color, basically acting as a flat normal map. And then I just mixed that in right here, you can see. And that's my material, folks. Another thing to note is that lighting is everything with metallic materials. Without an HDRI and hand-placed lights around your metallic objects, nobody's going to know what your shader really looks like. So this is without any lighting, and then this is with just an HDRI, and then this is with the hand-placed lights on as well. And if I jump over to my second view, you can see what those all look like. All right, so I thought I'd share with you a little bit of my comping process in After Effects. Um, so, you know, I added a couple of assets on top of here just to add some atmosphere and make it feel like it's in a space. So the first thing is this cool spotlight. And so if I just drop that in screen, drop that opacity, 
Um, you know, I think this just adds a little bit of mood. And sometimes adding these volumetric lights is actually just easier to drop in in post rather than trying to get it all in octane. Um, so then the other thing I added was these sparkling particles on a black background. So I just did Control Alt F and that just sizes it up to your comp. And um, then I'm gonna just gonna do the same thing, drop it in screen and just kind of drop it down until we get this nice subtle atmosphere. Um, the other thing I did was I kind of created this tilt shift look. So I did that with this depth of field gradient right here. And if we jump in this pre-comp, you see all it is is two white solids with a black to white gradient set to multiply. And you can use these handles right here to determine what's in focus and what's not and how fast that fall off occurs. So if I actually just copy this over and paste it in here, um, we can grab our camera lens blur plugin, which comes with After Effects, and I'll just create a new solid real quick. And this is going to be an adjustment layer, so I'll just enable that little icon right there. We can drop our camera lens blur onto our white solid, turn off that gradient, and if we set our blur map layer right here to depth of field gradient, now the outside edges are more in focus and the inside is not, so we want to invert that real quick just with this invert icon. And let's turn up the blur radius to something like 15 and see what that looks like. Um, the next thing that we want to do is we want to check repeat edge pixels and that fixes that edge right there um, from falling off into black. And then the other thing that I did was turn up the aspect ratio to two. Oh, sorry, actually 0 0.5. And now it's sort of recreating or mimicking more of an anamorphic lens by stretching it out. Thank you for watching, that's all for this tutorial. I hope you enjoyed it. To recap, we created a Daredevil inspired dripping effect with XP Infectio. We went over a cool camera trick. I showed you how to build a tileable animated gold swirl material, and I showed you a little bit of the AE comping process. I welcome your feedback. If you have any questions or concerns or suggestions for future tutorials, please let me know in the comments. My name's Ryan Talbot, and I'll catch you next time.